I'd like to welcome you all to In Conservation With. My name is David Lindo, I'm also known as the Urban Birder, and uh, today um, our broadcast has been sponsored by the Depitaphion de Cathras, who are the tourism board that looks after the northern province of the two provinces of Extremadura in Spain, Western Spain, and also to Leica Sport Optics. And by the way, John, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, David. Right. So, um, yes, tonight's subject um, is a subject which I think um, is fascinating to a lot of people, um, hummingbirds, and in particular, my good friend John and his book, which he's written, um, <laughs> I've got the wrong way around, there you go. <laughs> the Glitter in the Green in Search of Hummingbirds, and it's, I'll tell you what, it's a very, very good read. Um, I've known John again I don't know how long but for a long time actually John maybe you might have a better idea oh it's um, going to be about 10 years now David 10 years um but I've been a great fan of John's for some time um John for those who um follow the British birding scene um may know of the rare bird alert and John writes the the monthly or oh, sorry weekly report for the rare bird alert alert and the thing I love about it is I love John's style of writing. It's very, um, he uses some really interesting words for start and very, it's a very kind of inspiring read because it could potentially be quite a dry read, reading through a list of birds that have turned up that week. So the way you write it, John, congratulations. It's very refreshing. It makes me want to rush out and actually try and find some of these birds. So thank you very much for, for bringing that light into my life every week. Oh, mate, I'm glad you enjoy it. And I, I just have to say that I enjoy writing them because I live up on the Shetland Islands and, you know, we get a lot of rare birds. But at the same time, there's a lot of the year when it's very quiet here. And for me, it's just awesome to be able to live vicariously the British birding scene just by writing about it each week. It makes me feel like I'm in the heart of it. And I love that. That's fantastic. And uh, talking about rarities, you, uh, you, you bumped into one today, didn't you, in your garden? I did well, not my garden, garden, but just just outside the window. Yeah, I've, I've, my house list's gone up to 188 species today. And that was a black-throated thrush. So it's been a good day, and two humpback whales this morning as well from the kitchen window. That's fantastic. I found a rarity the other day, and I was a bit disappointed. It wasn't listed in your in your listings. I, I oh, found no. uh, what have I missed? I found a, a, a Lithuania's fifth ever petrol sandpiper. Oh. And I thought, you know, I was being hoisted upon upon Lithuanian shoulders okay. um, then, but I didn't get uh, there wasn't a mention in the uh, in the rare oh, bird alert. David, you should have told me. <laughs> I can't keep track of every rare bird in Europe. I do try, but you should have let me know. Um, John um, is a, is a writer, a natural history writer. You didn't actually start off in natural history. You didn't have the the classic start, did you? Because you were an economist, weren't you? And before that. Yeah. Oh, God. Before. Well, wow. OK. Um, very quick potted history. My mum and dad didn't want me to be anything to do with natural history. That was all I was interested in as a kid. I just loved the natural world. Being out in the countryside was all I wanted to do. And my mum and dad didn't see that for me. They wanted me to be the first person in the family to go to university and to sort of you know do better, which is completely sort of, you know, great for parents to want that for their kids. But they didn't sort of support my dream of, of being a naturalist. And so I ended up flunking my A-levels. Um, I didn't uh, want to go on to read law at university like my mum and dad wanted. And in one last sort of act of obedience to my dad, instead of resitting my A-levels to, to, you know, to go on to try and live my dream of being an ecologist, I went and did the next best thing for them, which was a business degree. Couldn't have been more bored by business if I tried. But um, when I moved to Shetland 20 years ago, um, I found that I had a degree which, which could get me a job with the council working as a, um, an agricultural um, development officer. So basically, I was an economist for 15 years for Shetland Islands Council. Before I moved to Shetland, though, I, I had a, a checkered uh, career. After I graduated, I sold cars for six years and... Then I sold drugs for two years. I sold pharmaceutical drugs for a Japanese drugs company. 
People always do that, David. They always go, what? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I had a slightly changed path to where I am now. But all along, I wanted to be a, you know, I wanted to be involved in the natural world in some way. And it was, well, I, I did uh, started doing some wildlife tour leading. And then I started to do some writing. And I wrote um, the text for a guide about sea mammals for Princeton University Press. And then co-authored Britain's Mammals, again for Princeton. And then I got my big break. One day I was out um, on a pal's boat showing people um, the gannet trees at Noss off uh, the east coast of Shetland. And the people on the boat were a family. And one of the members of the family was, she worked at a literary agency in London. And her grand sort of said to me, oh, if you want to write books, then you need to talk to my granddaughter. And so I did eventually. and. I ended up getting a book deal and I wrote a book called Orchid Summer, all about wild orchids in Britain and Ireland. That did really well and people liked it, which was the main thing. And then I got offered another book deal. And this one was for the glitter in the green for the hummingbird book. And this was this was the big break because that was going to be published in Britain and America. And at that point, I thought, right. I can I can take the jump now. I can stop this dull life of working for the man and I can you know, live my best life. I can be a naturalist. I can write about nature. I can inspire people, hopefully entertain people as well, because, you know, as a writer, I like to tell colourful stories um, and, yeah, be a wildlife tour leader as well. And so I, that's, that was what I did two years ago. And my timing was brilliant because long came a pandemic and I haven't led a tour for, well, virtually two years. Yeah, true. I mean, I think most of us have been fairly redundant in that field, if, if we are mm -hmm. tour leaders. That's a, it's a great uh, story in terms of how you kind of bucked your trend in terms of where you should have been, according to your parents, to do what you're doing now, which is great. Um, you, uh, in your um, bio, you talked about once being stalked by a mountain <laughs> lion, which I was really fascinated yeah. by, because mountain lion is, is my favourite animal full stop mm -hmm. and I think I was once stalked by one in uh, in a valley in um in a canyon uh in Los Angeles I just heard um, I was I saw a bird flying into the bushes and I came off the track to go into the bushes to look for it and I I heard a rustle behind me actually alongside me but slightly behind me and it didn't sound like a deer and I had this feeling of fear but excitement at the same time and I thought you know, I felt like I've met a mate, but maybe I should sort of uh, step out <laughs> to play this in case. Tell us yeah. about your experience. Yeah, so I was with um, an American naturalist, um, Teresa, and we were going down a, a canyon on sort of the, the Arizona-Mexico border, and we were we were looking for, for, for just any sort of birds which had come across from the, from the Mexican side, anything interesting. And uh, we we came to this sort of place where the canyon um, had sloping sides and up at the top of the slopes there were these these sort of caves in the in the cliffs and I'm just like a little boy when I see caves I want to go and have a look inside the caves and so I was oh my god caves I'm going to go and look in there and Teresa said to me oh, you know, I don't think you should there might be people in there and of course we'd been seeing tons of footprints and trash which were you know sort of indicated that people were heading north up this canyon across the border they were legally crossing at night and I said, oh, it'll be fine. You know, I, I speak Spanish. I'm obviously a birder. Look at me. You know, I'm hardly border patrol. I'm not very threatening. I said, it'll be fine. And anyway, I went up to the caves and didn't find any anything. Um, no people. There were some signs there'd been people camping in there, but that was it. But Teresa back down at the bottom of the canyon, she was getting a bit agitated. And she's like, come on, you know, I think we, we need to move. I, I think someone's watching us. I don't feel very comfortable. And I have that sort of logical thing where I think, well, how, how do you know someone's watching you? How does that work? You know, but anyway, I humoured her and I went back to her and we carried on walking and uh, we got about half a mile down the canyon and the sides sort of kind of closed in and the stream that was running down the bottom of the canyon just filled the way ahead. And the only way to carry on would have been to, to wade, you know, waist deep through. So we thought, right, we'll turn around. So we turned around and we knew we had about half a day of hiking to get back to her, her car. And as we started to go back into the bushes, we'd just come through. This mountain lion just erupted from my feet in the bushes. It was, you know, I almost trod on it. And it just went running up the sides of the canyon. And it was, I can't describe it better than say it was like a big furry eel. It was so fast and sinuous as it went up the side. 
and it, it sort of vanished from sight and you could hear it caterwauling, this terrible sort of screaming and yowling. And of course, I'm just like grabbing from a camera, just like, oh my God, you know, mountain lion. And, and I sort of wanted to kind of follow it to see if I could get pictures. And Teresa was like, you are not going up after that cat. That is one really pissed off kitty. And so we headed on back up, to, up the track and you could see these massive paw marks overlaid over our footprints in the, in, in the mud on the path. And it started following us at the place where she'd got really freaked out and thought someone was watching us. So may, maybe she was, she was feeling that cat watching her then. So, you know, I, who knows what it would have done. I mean, I'm sure they say they're just mostly curious about, you know, people, but I think we did the really unexpected thing for it of just turning around, just walking up to it and kind of startled it. And that, it, was scared, that would have scared the bejesus out of me, I think. Well, that was the thing you see, because when it happened, I was just really excited. But afterwards, when you're seeing the footprints, and then we start thinking about it. Yeah, I, I absolutely had that sort of adrenaline shaking thing. It was it was pretty scary with hindsight. Wow. So um, let's talk about your first and early kind of experiences with nature. What do you mm. remember? Was there a, as uh, our American friends say, was there a spark moment or were you just always into nature? <sighs> I was always into it, but you know, I can remember sp quite specific early memories, my sort of early childhood memories. I remember seeing a fox walking across the field behind our house. And as a really little kid, I was really scared of dogs and wolves. And as far as I was concerned, a fox was kind of like a, a red gingery wolf. So as a little boy, that was it. I had nightmares for years about foxes because I was so frightened. But at the same time, I was really fascinated by them and the fact they were living out there. And so... Yeah, there was there was things like that, but also seeing the birds coming into the garden. Um, and God, this is like sort of the, the, the spark of becoming a bit of a twitcher because, you know, you, you get to know the birds that come into your garden and come to the bird feeder and everything. And then one day there were these weird thrushes feeding on the pyracantha in the in the garden on the berries one winter. And these are my first red wings. And that was, yeah, that was amazing. That was such an exotic looking bird for me. So that was kind of like a gateway moment. I thought, oh, my God, you know, there are other birds out there, which I just don't know about. And uh, but I mean, it was yeah, it wasn't just the birds, though. It was I, I'm kind of like a bower bird. I'm sort of drawn to color. I like really colorful stuff. And so I, you know, once you get beyond sort of the blue tits and the green finches, a, a lot of the birds I was seeing around our home in Somerset were quite drab things, you know, warblers and stuff like that, reed warblers especially, and because we lived on the Somerset levels. And I wasn't that interested in their behaviour at that stage. I just wanted to see really cool things. And so my attention kind of wandered for a bit away from birding, and, and I started to notice butterflies, especially in the summer. And I was that little boy who wanted to, you know, get caterpillars and feed them and see what they turned into. Um, and slow worms. I remember finding slow worms in a compost heap on my mum's allotment. And I thought that was amazing. They're like little snakes. They were great. Um, but also wildflowers, um, the orchids especially. And we, my mum and dad had like two or three nature books. We just had the little observers books of wildflowers, birds and butterflies. And they were kind of like my Bible. You know, that was my reference material. And I could not believe that you could get orchids in the English countryside. I was just, you know, mind blown. And I wanted nothing more than to see an orchid. I just couldn't believe they were really real. And then yeah, one day I, I saw my first orchid and that was the beginning of quite a sort of consuming passion for a while. And it was only when I sort of went to senior school when I was about 13 that the birding really kind of kicked back in because I met a couple of other kids who were really into it. And there was a teacher as well who was quite, or mentor and encouraged it and yeah then well as I was this brings us back to my mum and dad wanting me to be something I didn't want to be I used to flunk off school I used to to play truant and I'd hitchhike down to uh, we, I was in school in North Dorset and I'd hitchhike down to, to Weymouth to go to Radipole and then out onto Portland and yeah I used to uh, just go when I was meant to be uh, playing sport I, you know, organised sport, that wasn't my thing. I just wanted to go and see birds. Sounds a bit like me, absolutely. Yeah. Hummingbirds, let's get on to that. I mean, how did you, why did you, and when did you? 
Okay. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I'd be dissing my mum and dad and saying they didn't encourage me, but actually they kind of, you know, they had their moments. We had the bird feeder in the garden. And one day my mum took us up to London for a day out. And you have to understand for me living in the, the West country of, of England in a village, London was a scary proposition. You know, I'd read about London, I'd read Dickens and stuff. And, you know, I knew London was terrifying. And I really wasn't all that excited about it. And my mum sort of did all the touristy things, you know, took us to the Tower of London and, you know, went sort of changing the guard. And I couldn't have been less interested, but my mum was a savvy woman. And she saved what she knew would really fire me up for, for the last in the day, in the afternoon. We went to the Natural History Museum. So she had complete obedience from me all day because I was looking forward to, to going there. And I mean, it's a brilliant place. I mean, I know it's it's full of, effectively it's full of dead stuff, but you've got to understand that, you know, I was seeing things which were, and even to this day, you know, kids get fired up going in there. It's really cool. And I remember going in and we were walking around and we we're seeing all of these amazing taxidermy birds and things. And there was this cabinet and it, they've moved it now, but back in the day, or at least as my memory remembers this, there was this cabinet and it was in a corridor and this beam of sunlight was coming in onto it. And of course that's not great for taxidermy sunlight, but there, that's how I remember it. And I do remember that these birds, they were hummingbirds. There's this case of a hundred and something specimens all mounted in this kind of giant bush. And they were all different shapes and, and sort of sizes. They had amazing curved or very long straight bills and um, these amazing tail plumes. But the, the main thing which really caught my attention was the colours. And they just flared with, with these amazing iridescent colours. Every colour of the rainbow was there. And I just had no idea there were birds like this because you know how much natural history did you see on the telly back in the in the early 1980s? Not much. You know, there was the occasional life on Earth and that sort of thing. And and what was it called? Was it Habitat or Horizon or something? And you know, there was so little and no internet, of course. And so seeing these things, it was just like a complete window just opening to thinking, God, there's not just these birds which occasionally turn up in my my little suburban garden or our little village garden but you know there's there's different birds all around the world and i've never really thought of that you just sort of you know you see to the horizons of of your experience as a kid um and so yeah there there was other worldly birds and i really wanted to know more about them and you do what you did back then you go to the library and you know hummingbirds you know these things really hot and then, you know, you sort of maybe see a couple of bits of footage of hummingbirds on the telly. And, and that was it. You know, the more I could sort of bit by bit, I was sort of doing the pieces of the jigsaw and thinking, these are just otherworldly birds. Or oh, the birds like these things. Nothing looks like them. Nothing behaves like them. They've got this incredible life, you know, lifestyle feeding on nectar, the sugar fuel, which, as, again, as a kid who wasn't allowed any sweets as a little boy, yeah, I, I, I felt like I wanted to be like a hummingbird. I wanted, I wanted more sugar in my life. And so, yeah, I just, this was the, 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 the sort of family of birds which really captured, or overseas birds, which really captured my imagination. I think your entry into the world of hummingbirds was very similar to some people living in the old world, obviously not maybe necessarily mm. in, in, in North America, but certainly in Europe and the old world. I mean, myself, I remember going and seeing Probably, probably the same display, but certainly other display boxes in other museums. And even as recently as three years ago, two years ago, I was in Cleveland, no, not Cleveland, was at Cornell Laboratory in, uh, yeah. <laughs> excuse me, in Ithaca, upstate New York, New York. And I was privileged enough to be able to be taken backstage. And I was looking at some hummingbirds in uh, a tray and one of them was a coquette of some sort. And the iridescence of its crest, I mean, it, even though it's been long dead, I mean, it was just mm -hmm. so vibrant. It was like, you know, Christmas, you know, glitter. It was just incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It's just fascinating. And I still remember, I remember the first hummingbird I saw um, back in the early 2000s, not that long ago, really, uh, in Los Angeles, um, Anna's Hummingbirds. Um, yes. I, they, they kind of, you know, ten a penny there. Well, at least they were. And, you know, it was just incredible to see these hummingbirds all over the place and to watch them. Um, 
you talked about your first time in Berlin, didn't you, in your book? Yeah, yeah, that was that was in Arizona. It was the same trip when when I was stalked by the 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 mountain lion, and that was up in Madeira Canyon. They have these incredible habitats in the Arizona in the uh, the desert. They call them sky islands, and they're these sort of massive rocky outcrops which are, are big enough to have you know whole sort of ecosystems basically with trees and little creeks and all sorts up there. And it's this wonderful sort of lush green oasis in the middle of really uncompromising desert all around. And in the winter, they, they often get um, hummingbirds, you know, overwintering there. Some of the sort of the, the, the Mexican species come, come a little north. And the Madeira Canyon is, is a particularly famous place. There's a lot of feeders as well, which, of course, you know, that helps. And yeah, my, my pal Teresa took me up there because she knew I really wanted to see a hummingbird. And so it was quite near to her folks home. And so took me up there one, one morning. And yeah, it was back then they called it magnificent hummingbird. Of course, you know, the, you, know you know what it's like, splitters. Um, <laughs> it's no different with hummingbirds. They're busy splitting them into tons of different species. So it's now, uh, I think, Rivoli's hummingbird um, rather than... Uh, rather than Magnificent Hummingbird, but back then it was called Magnificent and it was, it, you know, it's a big hummer. And it, I, you know, I had no idea how kind of fearless a lot of hummingbirds are in our presence. And I think that's one of the things which sort of endears them to people because they, they don't sort of treat us with any caution. Um, you know, most we've, we've given most birds ample reason to fear us, but, uh, or to be cautious of us, but hummingbirds are just bold as brass, most of them. And this bird just approached me and sort of went buzzing past my face and then looked me in the eye and checked me out and then got back to feeding. And yeah, that was that was it. I was sold. Everything I'd sort of built them up to be, well, it was that and more. Let's actually, I mean, I'd love to talk to you about your book, obviously, because you went on this amazing journey um, to to see the uh, some you know various hummingbirds around the world, around the world, around the Americas. Um, but let's just quickly talk about the hummingbird itself because you know I often talk about hummingbirds in general talks I give and when I mention the facts do you realize that hummingbirds are actually related to swifts you know people go what <laughs> so can yeah. you give us the identity of a of a hum hummingbird okay well some some birds hover obviously you know kestrels can hover and you know so you know there's the owls hovering over fields and so on but Hummingbirds have, have just nailed it to a to a just a fine art. Um, the the relationship with the, the swifts is interesting because they it's a, a skeletal thing effectively. They've got um, an unusual kind of ball and socket wing joint, which means that they can move their wings in a different way to most birds. Most birds have a straightforward up and down flappy thing going on. Hummingbirds. Um, effectively can move their wings in, a, in a, a figure of eight rotation. So they're twisting their wings as they're flapping them up and down. And what this is giving them is, is lift on the, the downstroke like a normal bird, but also lift on the upstroke as well. So they're getting, I think, about 75% of their uplift from, from the downstroke, but another 25% from the upstroke. So this is this an amazing biomechanical adaptation which evolution has, has has gifted them, but to take advantage of that, you've you've got to have a heart which is 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 really going like a like an engine, and a hummingbird's heart is beating roughly a thousand times a thousand beats per minute, which is bonkers when you think about it. And what's that doing to those wings? Um, those wings are, are beating approximately as an average 50 beats per second which is where the hum of a hummingbird comes from it's 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 this this amazingly fast beat which makes a an audible hum um some species like the annas which you you saw your first hummingbirds they uh, when they dive um they're they're not just in free fall they're actually beating their wings as they dive in a display flight and their wings have been measured beating up to 200 beats per second at that point which is crackers when those annas pull up from their dive and this is the the males displaying they pull 9g in gravitational force which you know that's astonishing and you know we always got peregrines being like you know like great masters of of you know of flight and diving and so on but anna's hummingbird achieves the uh, fastest um, 
uh, what do we call it, um, velocity of 385 body lengths per second of any vertebra in that dive. So it's actually diving faster than a peregrine falcon in its, in its, in its way, highest specific velocity of any vertebra. I just, you know, that's, this is, this is what I love about hummingbirds. They are just creatures of, of extremes and superlatives. Um, oh, what else could I tell you about them? Pectoral muscles. Yeah, it's a really obvious one. The, 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 the chest muscles, which are uh, the flapping. Um, most birds, um, those muscles account for about 15% of their body mass. Hummingbirds, 30%. So it's twice what normal birds have. So these things are just like, a Formula One car, they are just the sort of absolute peak of, 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 of evolution of their And I love that about them. And yet, here's the cool thing. When you're, you're living at such an extreme um, at night, these things, um, they can't feed. Hummingbirds can't feed at night. And they can't just go to sleep because their metabolisms are so highly geared. And so they don't go to sleep. They, they effectively go into what someone, one of the scientists described to me as controlled hypothermia. They go into a state of torpor and their wing, their, sorry, their hearts, um, their heart rate goes from that thousand beats per minute down to, to below a hundred beats per minute, which for a hummingbird is barely ticking over. And their body temperature drops to a couple of degrees above the ambient temperature, the air temperature. Now, if you think about hummingbirds, they're found in the Americas from sea level, from deserts, but also right up to just below the snow line in, in the Andes. So there's some hummingbirds up, up north of 14,000 feet. And those hummingbirds at night, it's getting down to almost freezing. And they're in a state of, of absolute torpor. And believe it or not, NASA back in the 1960s, when they were starting to talk about putting astronauts you know, into space and doing long space travel, this was before you know, they decided the moon was enough and they're now going back to long space travel. But back then they actually looked at hummingbirds and their state of torpor and, and were thinking, can we put human beings into a state of torpor for long space travel? They actually looked at hummingbirds. Wow. They, do, do, do any um, hummingbirds, am I wrong in thinking that there is a hummingbird that actually hibernates or is that the night mm -hmm. hawk I'm thinking of? No, they don't. They don't. No, they don't hibernate. But I mean, it is kind of like a state of hibernation. This torpor is 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 pretty impressive for the, for the space of of the you know the sort of the, the, the eight to twelve hours of of nighttime. Effectively, they are living on on their energy reserves, and they've had to close everything down. Heart barely barely ticking over, body temperature right down, and then they reanimate in the morning. That's amazing. And when you think also, added to all of that, the amazing journeys that some of those birds do. Because um, mm. I remember reading in your book, in fact, the, when you went to Alaska, yeah. you were on the lookout for a particular species which has the longest recorded migration of any hummingbird. That's right. Yeah. Rufus hummingbird. Um, there was one which was it was ringed in uh, Tallahassee in Florida. And it was recovered up um, in Alaska, three and a half thousand miles away. That was a female hummingbird. And again, length specific. You know, we talk about these amazing bird migrations, the great ones we know about, the Arctic terns, which go from the Arctic to the Antarctic, or the bar-tailed godwits, which cross the Pacific from, from uh, North America to, to New Zealand for, for, for the winter. And, you know, those are, those are great migrations, but they're quite big birds. Whereas a rufous hummingbird, it weighs little more than a you know a two p piece. It's tiny, and three and a half thousand miles for such a tiny bird, it's incredible. Uh, especially a bird which is mostly fueled by sugar. And I mean, you know, we and that you know that's something which people think they they just eat nectar hummingbirds, but that's not true. They they eat insects, spiders, you know, small invertebrates. They they need a bit of roughage and they need a bit of protein too. But by and large, you know, it's it's all about the, the, the sort of calorific uh, high octane nectar. And so to do a migration like that, that's amazing. And they actually are following the spring, as it were, which is as it's sweeping north across across America. But they get to to Alaska before there's any flowers bring the first males and they stake a territory. And, you know, what do you do if you're a hummingbird and you've turned up in a cold place that's still kind of in the grips of winter? 
and you need to feed. And I love this. They've, they've turned into little sneak thieves. They find um, sapsucker wells, you know, the little woodpeckers which drill um, the little wells in, 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 um, in trees and then ga gather the sap, drink the sap that collects in the little holes they've drilled. Well, the hummingbirds nip in, have a little drink of the, of the sap and then shoot off before the sapsucker can notice them. So they're, they're little sneak thieves. That's, that's amazing. You talked about yeah. the you talked about the sound they make as well, which is interesting because I remember I was in Jamaica and I was watching um, the red tailed stream, red bill streamer tail, mm -hmm. which is their national bird, the doctor bird as they call it. Yeah, and the the humming. I, I remember because I was trying to look for the black billed uh, streamer tail, which is more rest range restricted, and the red tail, the red billed had a very distinctive buzz of its wing. It sounded like a cross between a purring cat and the, the purr of a turtle dove. It was really very, yeah. very distinctive. It's, it's interesting because different species really do have, once you've got your sort of ear tuned in, that you, just like you say, they do have a very distinctive hum. And I think Cuba was where I sort of noticed that for the first time, the Cuban emeralds of kind of to a penny, but Every now and again, a bee hummingbird would come in and it's a totally different sound. And you could pick them up on ear, even though you hadn't seen the bird yet. You just you knew there was one somewhere. And it was a similar experience in Colombia with dusky star front. Work. This was up in up in the Andes and in, in the uh, I think it's the eastern Cordillera. And there were tons of tourmaline sun angels. And these guys are just real feisty, fight anything kind of hummingbirds. And you could hear them just zipping around all the time. And then the first I knew of a dusky star front that being anywhere nearby was this, this amazing deep sort of throaty flight, this humming. And it was, I, I think in the book, I likened it to sort of, you know, you hear car engines and then you hear a V8 and you're like, oh, what's that? And I had that, what the heck is that? That's got to be what I'm looking for. And sure enough, it, it proved to be. Yeah, it's interesting. You talked about, Excuse me about bee uh, bee hummingbirds, um, yeah. which kind of brings me on to the smallest and the largest. Um, the bee hummingbird is the smallest, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, maybe, probably, who knows? There's there's a bit of of, of controversy about it because there's a, another hummingbird. Um, funnily enough, I think it's found in Jamaica, the vervain, the bourbon, the verbian, right? And that lives mostly in the treetops, doesn't it? It's it's kind of a canopy thing, and it was. It was found before um, bee hummingbird. It was described before bee hummingbird, and for some years it was the smallest hummingbird in the world. And then um, along came the bee hummingbird, found on Cuba, and it's it's a little prettier. The male uh, bee hummingbird. It's got this really lovely sort of like a hot coal sort of um, gorget and mustachial stripes. It's very beautiful, and I think because it had novelty on its side and because it was a little bit prettier, um, it. You know, it kind of usurped the, 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 the hummingbird. But there's a little conjecture that actually it may not be the smallest. It might actually be your Jamaican little guys there. The How do you pronounce that? The I thought it was Verbian. Okay. Ver 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 Vervain, but anyway. Um, Vervain, yeah. But yeah, the thing yeah. is, um, I read somewhere that the, the Verbian or Vervain had the smallest egg in the world, which made me so think, well, I thought the bee eater had, uh, bee, the bee eater, the bee hummingbird had that. <laughs> Well, see, this this is it. You could be, you could, it could be right. As I say, it's, there's some controversy about this. It could well be that actually the bee isn't the smallest. But I mean, to put them in in, in context, it's still a hell of a small bird, um, five to six centimeters long, and it weighs one and a half to two grams. So that's less than a penny. Uh, you know, that's just and there's, it's one of those things. I, there's there were certain moments when I was seeing hummingbirds when. You know, you kind of expect them to be kind of cool or exciting or whatever. But bee hummingbird, I expected it to be small. But when you actually see your first bee hummingbird, it's it's a proper jaw dropping stuff. Whoa, that is so tiny. How can a bird be that small? Um, and also when they're really close to you as well. Like a really interesting moment when I was watching bee hummingbirds. And if a large dragonfly flew into the garden, the bee hummingbirds just vanished into the trees they immediately scattered and you know no one's seen a dragonfly take a hummingbird but 
what I was seeing was hummingbird, bee hummingbirds treating dragonflies with enormous respect, which you know suggests they they you know have good reason to fear them. So what does munch on a bee hummingbird? I don't know. I don't know what would eat a bee hummingbird. Mantids certainly would. Are there any mantids in Cuba? Because Matt, there was a really interesting study looking at what um, had eaten um, hummingbirds. And in, t- in terms of insects, man- mantids, you know, the praying mantises, it was something crazy, like 95% of all invertebrate eating hummingbird incidents were, were mantids. They are consummate hunters and more than capable of taking a hummingbird. Yeah. Um, that's, well, okay, we're talking about small, the smallest, but I suppose the biggest is less conjecture, is there? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's it's unequivocal. Um, the big guy is the giant hummingbird. Um, and Good name. It's, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's, there's no ambiguity there. Um, it's relative, though. We're not talking like a sort of, you know, a, a great big giant sort of, you know, pigeon sized hummingbird. No, a, a giant hummingbird is, is about 20, 22 centimetres long. Um, and in terms of weight, it's about 18 to 20 grams. And so we're talking something which is more petite than a starling. You know, this is not a bit. Yeah, I, yeah, I likened them when I saw them in Peru to almost being like beater sized. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Smaller, but... They are, and they're, 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 you know, they're, 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 they're noticeably bigger than other hummingbirds you come across. But at the same time, we, we, you know, we're not talking a, a huge, hefty beast. Sorry, just copying there. Um, yeah, that's in, that's incredible. Um, I, I, I find them amazing. Um, in your book, you talked about, I mean, there's an element um, which kind of saddened me, really, because your book, I suppose, through the world of hummingbirds, just shows how fragile our, our environment is. I mean, in the early days, it was a feather trade, wasn't it? People were yeah. indiscriminately collecting his birds for feathers mm-hmm. mm. absolutely the um well i'm actually in fact before the feather trade um before europeans came along and started exporting hummingbirds and it the numbers are colossal they were exported in their millions to europe primarily to london and paris but also to um, new york um for for the millinery trade the hat trade but before that became a thing because they are so colourful, they'd caught the attention of um, native people in, in the Americas before we turned up and, and started to do all the bad stuff we did, us Europeans. The, the native people had, had collected hummingbirds and incorporated their feathers into um, clothing, into jewellery, into, um, into shields for, for war ceremonial display um, in warfare. Um, the priests of the Aztecs wore hummingbird um, decorations. And when the, the Spanish doors turned up, um, they were really impressed by the feather work they saw, as well as the, the gold and the jewellery and so on, which they were sending back to, to, the, to the old world. And they, they sent back hummingbird, um, hummingbird feathers as well. And in the Aztec world, hummingbird feathers were actually accorded uh, an equal value to precious metals and jewels. So they really were seen as as a high status commodity. And the conquistadors, of course, um, part of what they they wanted to do was to completely crush all um, native religion and replace it with uh, Catholicism. And they they turned the, the, the uh, there was a whole class of craftsmen in the Aztec Empire called Amantecas who created these amazing feather um, creations for the priests and for the nobility and for the warriors. And they, they turned the Amantecas to producing um, iconography, Christian iconography. So, you know, you'd have a picture of the, the Virgin Mary and the, and the baby Jesus, but instead of it just being painted, um, they used to get the Amantecas to use tiny slivers of hummingbird feathers to create these astonishingly iridescent and colourful and impactful um, images of Christian um, stuff. And these were, were sent back to, to Europe and, of course, the, the, the Pope of the day or pa- Popes of the day, the papacy, but also you know, lesser people in the church were, were completely smitten with them. 
and nobility as well. You know, the nobles, kings and, and, and so on wanted this stuff in their personal collections. And so this sort of appetite for hummingbird feathers kind of began then in Europe. But then when fashion really became a sort of a thing, and I guess the, the growth in the late 19th century of the middle classes with disposable income, and women, you know, wanted to, to, to wear a fancier hat than the next door neighbor or, or, and so on. And, you know, young working class women wanted to have literally a feather in their cap to show that they were sort of, you know, lifting themselves out of, out of, of abject poverty and were coming ahead in life. And so the feather trade was, was this monstrous thing. Hummingbirds were, were recognized, they were talked of in the, the Times as being something which even the poorest girl in the slums could afford a hummingbird to, to wear on her, her hat. So they were seen as this sort of really cheap consumable thing because they were so small and they sold for pennies. But equally, they were incorporated into really grand, you know, hats for, for the most fashionable ladies. And as I say, in their millions were, were slaughtered and exported every year to Europe. And they were part of what drove in, in the UK um, the formation of ultimately the, uh, the RSPB and in the US, the, the National Audubon Society. Um, both of those, those organizations grew from revulsion um, amongst some women of the time in, in those respective countries at the, the, the horrors of the feather trade. And I think it was certainly in the UK, it was 19. 19- 21, the, 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 the Feather Act came through, which stopped that, that, that hideous trade dead in the water. And you sort of think that's an end to it, and some good came of it. So those conservation bodies were born. But amazingly, in the, I think it was the 1930s, there was an Italian um, chocolatier um, that actually imported 30,000 hummingbirds, dead hummingbirds, to be stuck on boxes of chocolates as a, a as a decoration to get people to buy the boxes of chocolates, so you know we carry on sort of consuming them and you know now obviously this stuff doesn't happen, well not it does to a lesser extent still in Mexico because there's a, a tradition there of chuparosas these these love charms where the, the sort of the, the logic goes that if you wear a hummingbird as a, an amulet then you'll get the, the love of the, the person you, your heart desires. Now that sort of still continues and there's young people who you know, still really believe this. It's not like an old sort of fuddy-duddy tradition. Young people still really buy into this. And hummingbirds get seized at the US border being <laughs> illegally, of course, into the US from Mexico because there's such a Mexican diaspora there. Um, yes, yeah, so there's still an illegal trade in dead hummingbirds there. So, you know, it, it, it's, uh, but what has happened, of course, is, as we all, we all talk, is that our sort of consumption of the natural world has become, instead of quite focused on particular things, whether it's hummingbirds or egrets or whatever for, for hats, our consumption has just become a bit more sort of um, scattergun, hasn't it? It's like firing a shotgun at something because, you know, we, we, we buy, unless we're very careful, we buy products with palm oil in it. And you only have to travel through through parts of South America to see palm oil plantations, you know, springing up where there was once um, virgin or secondary forest. So you, you realize that, you know, habitat has been lost and with it, not just hummingbirds, but everything else which was living in that habitat. So we, we've continued to consume them just in a different sort of more uh, anonymous way, which is, is in a way more sinister and sad. So nowadays, I mean, obviously, as you say, the, the millinery trade is as good as dead and buried now. But now we're destroying habitat. Obviously, yeah. I mean, what's the percentage of species? Firstly, how many species are there, and okay. what percentage of those <laughs> live live in in jungles and forests? And I guess my leading question is the fact mm. that those jungles and forests have been dis- deforested at an alarming rate, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Um, so the the uh, there's no easy there's no easy answers to any of this. Approximately, how many hummingbirds are there? Roughly three hundred and fifty or sixty species, but that number is going up all the time, which sounds really positive. But it's it's a taxonomy thing. It's kind of like an accounting exercise because you know we're not often discovering completely new sort of you know gobsmacking you know markedly morphologically different hummingbirds anymore. 
But what's happening is people are like they are with with you know warblers in the in the Palearctic. We're we're looking at them all a lot more closely, starting to realise that certain ones which we had thought were one species actually have distinctive geographical ranges, different vocalizations, perhaps even different DNA. And, and we're realizing that actually, you know, we've perhaps been looking not closely enough at them. So their numbers in terms of species and accounting exercise are, are increasing really year on year. Um, there are lost hummingbirds. There are hummingbirds which have become extinct um, or lost. Um, but, and then to, to move to the next bit of the question, where are all these hummingbirds? Um, they are sparingly found in temperate zones. So yes, um, you get Rufus and um, Anna's hummingbirds at 60 degrees north um, in Alaska, which is the same line of latitude as the Shetland Islands, which is amazing. You know, that's, that's a tough hummingbird that's living up there, is, is going there for the summer to, to breed. Um, but they're in a minority. Most hummingbirds are found in 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 the around the, the sort of the, the equator and the, the 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 in the Andes, where you've you've got the greatest diversity of species. And of course, with with altitude as well, not just being near to the equator, but also with altitude, you've got the the all of the different um, different zones as you're going up up and downhill, as well as in terms of lines of latitude. So. The Andes kind of allowed hummingbirds when they arrived in the Americas because they came from Europe originally. When they got to the Americas, that was the place that they really were able to, to flourish and evolve into this sort of amazing diversity of form and shape and so on. Um, yeah. Finish where you, where you what you were saying. Yeah, we you know we all know that 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 um, habitat is being lost in South America at a, in some places an absolutely ferocious rate. And but you know, putting some sort of figures on that to give you an example, the Atlantic forest in uh, Brazil, um, you know, there's still some of it left and you can you go into it and you feel like you're in an amazing, um, incredible biodiverse um, area. But over 90 percent of the Atlantic forest is gone. It's just gone. Um, and that's in the space of what, 150 years. And so what's left is tiny. It's a fragment of what was once there. It's not, you know, I mean, it's still happening now, of course, in Bolsonaro and, and the Amazon, but this stuff's been going on for a long time. He's just the latest in a line of, of, of people who've just seen um, the Americas as this rich resource to, to turn into to farmland, to, to mine, or to exploit. And so, you know, what, what was lost there? For all we know, there, there, there could be species of not just hummingbird, but everything invertebrates reptiles you name it which which were gone before we even knew they existed yeah i mean so, i i went to I, i've been to the north atlantic forest at least part of it and i was mm -hmm. horrified you know as you mm -hmm. said it was literally been destroyed in the in the, in, in as little as 150 years yeah. and there's about five percent left but when i was actually there uh, the forest that I was walking through was actually secondary forest. It's not even primary forest. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just scary. It is terrifying. We, yeah, we've lost stuff before we knew we had it. And of course, in you know the, today, talking in the wake of of COP twenty six, you know we know what a mess we've made of our stewardship. If if that's not too arrogant, the stewardship of this world that we live in, and we you know are the most populous and and. <sighs> influential not necessarily in a good way species on the on the face of the planet we know what an absolute mess we've made of it and yet still there isn't the the political will to to really grasp the the nettle and do something about about stopping that and living more responsibly here and addressing what we've done and you know this is this is horribly depressing stuff but it's it's not slowing down well it's slowing down perhaps what we're doing but it's still not stopping and that's the critical thing Okay. Um, yeah, let's let's get onto slightly lighter stuff now. I mean, yeah, basically, let's cheer things up a bit. Yeah, you mentioned that they hummingbirds originally came from the old world, which is like what? And <laughs> yeah. the other question leading on from that is, if they came from the old world, how come they're not here still? <laughs> um, oh, but, <laughs> there's a, there's a, probably a glib and flippant answer to that, but the the the, the story of this is really cool. There was uh, a German. Um, paleontologist um, Gerald Meyer who 
some years ago was looking at some fossils on his desk in 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 uh, in his his lab, and they were b- early bird fossils, and they'd been dug out of a, a clay pit, I think, in Austria. And he he was looking at these fossils, and he suddenly had that sort of eureka moment of thinking, "Hang on a second, I recognise the, the 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 these these wings, the 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 form of these wings. These are hummingbirds," and he called the these these hummingbirds Eurotrochilus inexpectatus. Now, my sort of Linnaean uh, Latin stroke Greek isn't that good, but even I can work that one out. That's unexpected European hummingbird. And the cool thing about this is there's fossil hummingbirds found in the Americas as well, and they're about two million years old, which is old. But the ones that Maya had found, I think, were aged at 25 to 30 million years old. And subsequently, other fossils have been found in, in France and Germany as well, which are of similar form. And, so, and, you know, they all date to the same time. So we know that the original hummingbirds evolved in Europe. And this isn't such a uh, sort of astounding thing, because, I mean, there's, there's other birds which are now found in the Americas, which originated here. So um, quatsins, these amazing, you know, the amazing birds which have got this, on the young ones, the little claws on the, the, the wings. They originated here in Europe as well. And at some point, of course, they must have crossed over into the Americas. But then in Europe, we had a succession of ice ages. And this is what we have to assume did for, for, for hummingbirds in particular, because they were evolving, co-evolving with flowers to be pollinators. And to, the flowers were producing nectar to, as an inducement for the hummingbirds to visit them. Um, and so, of course, these, these birds were so dependent by that point on a very specialized uh, path evolutionary path which needed a, mostly um the, the neotropics rather than increasingly chilly europe and so yeah that's why we lost them um it got cold so you uh you do your work or some of your work with the rare bird alert people so you're obviously quite quite privy to most of the rarities that show up in the world has <sighs> there ever been a record of hummingbirds in in the old world i, I seem to remember vaguely there might be one or two records in the Russian bit that sort of touches Alaska, which is kind of what you'd expect. But was there not a record in Iceland once? I don't Do you know? think so. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think a ruby throat is, I mean, I could be wrong. I don't think there's a Western Palearctic record of, 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 of any hummingbird. It's one of those weird things. You, you, it crops up. It's like a, a, an urban myth. It's like a rural myth that someone else from, I don't know, Asia will say, oh, I've got hummingbirds in the garden or I've seen hummingbirds in such and such a place. And what it invariably turns out to be are hawk moths, fingered moths, which, of course, you know, even the, the little guys like the hummingbird hawk moth, you know, they, they, they hover and, and do that whole nectar probing thing. But really big hawk moths like convolvulus hawk moths will also do it. And when you see one of those bad boys feeding at Nicotiana flower, they're big and, you know, they really are sort of impressive. And I guess someone could mistake one for a hummingbird if it's possible. But no, I don't think so. I don't think the, the large ocean crossing is possible for them. Yeah, but that's what I said about a lot of species. And yet we still get... <laughs> yeah, never say never. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I, I say this now and then one day I'll be, be writing red bird and there'll have been a, a ruby-throated hummingbird picked up moribund at Cape Clear or something and it'll be... God... What a week that'll be to be doing red bird. I'll enjoy that. Exactly. How many of the world's hummingbirds have you seen? I do you know. I really don't know, David. This is a, a really, a really weird thing, which, which makes birders recoil from me. I don't keep lists. The only list I keep is my house list these days. So I, I could, I could tell you what species I haven't seen. So if someone said, "Do you want to go and see, I don't know, Avocet Bill?" I'd be, "Oh yeah, I'd love to," but because um, I've not seen one. But I, I don't I don't keep lists. I, I've no I absolutely no idea how many I've seen. It's 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 it, it it was a thing which happened when I moved to Shetland because before I moved here, I was as big a bird lister as you know you could be. I'd chase off after rare birds all around the country. I did all of that stuff. And if you'd said, "What's your life list, John? What's your British list?" I'd have known in an instant. I haven't a clue now. No idea. And it was a really conscious thing that I thought when I'm moving here, I just want to sort of bird around here, and and stop listing happy to record stuff you know for 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 the Shetland bird report or you know doing the 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 swan surveys and so on you know that's different that's that's gathering data and it feels meaningful but keeping a list nah not my thing 
what is your favourite hummingbird? Oh, that's easy. Um, it's not. I say that's easy. It's not easy because there are so many cool ones in so many different ways. But it's got to be the marvellous spatula tail. I am just in love with that thing because it's got the mystique. You know, it was it was something which existed for years as just one specimen which was collected in the mid 1800s it wasn't until the late 1800s that another one was found and i mean just look at it it's preposterous with those huge long filamentous tail feathers with a, a spatula on the end of each and they have an amazing when you see video of them doing their courtship dance you know, well worth a google when we all stop talking google this because there's a, an attenborough narrated sequence of film of the male marvellous spatula tail and he's displaying to a female in uh, in this sort of amphitheatre of lichen encrusted branches and he curves his tail up like a lyre around him and he's like, shaking and shivering of these discs at the female it's brilliant stuff it's very sexy um so and I, I also they're only found in one very specific region of north peru um and so you've got to go to one particular place to see them. They're rare. Um, they were in trouble. They're, they're perhaps a, a little less trouble now that people are starting to, to, to turn coffee plantations and you know, former marijuana plantations as well in, back to planting with some native plants because people are realizing that ecotourism has a value and people are actually prepared to pay and come and see these things, which is important. You know, this, uh, this perhaps is... is Part of a solution to what we were discussing earlier um so it's 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 not easy to see not particularly easy it's very beautiful it's got fantastic behavior um yeah that's my favorite for sure I think my favorite literally dropped when i saw one wow i think my favorite um actually it's more the name than the actual appearance even though it's a beautiful bird and that's the uh, the bearded mountaineer one of great oh, yeah. birds Oh, isn't it? And that's the really cool thing about hummingbirds. They do have such cool names. And I love that. I mean, another of my favourites, my top three would include Velvet Purple Coronet. And I mean, that is a beautiful bird, but also what a name. It's just great. If you could be anywhere on this planet right now, notwithstanding the current uh, restrictions in some places, where would you be right now? Oh, I'd like to be in Ecuador right now, I think. <laughs> I... It was my first taste of the neotropics was Ecuador. And I mean, I, I, oh God, I love Colombia. That's really hard. No, I, I changed that. I'm not going to go with Ecuador. Much as I'd love to be there, I, I, I Colombia is my favourite South American country. Um, not just for the birds and the wildlife, but for the people too. They're just such a wonderful, wonderful nation. Yeah, it's a fantastic place, Colombia. I've been, been lucky enough to go there a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Okay, um, just to uh, inform the Zoomers here and anyone else watching, um, the come up and coming uh, ICWs, as they're now called, um, on a, uh, November the 25th at 7 o'clock GMT, we've got two guys, Vic and Ken, Vic Fairbrother and Ken Hutchinson, who were, have been studying ring oozles, my favourite bird, for the last 20, 25 years. So they've written the book and we're gonna be talking about that, which is gonna be great. Um, it, on the 29th of November, seven o'clock, uh, a young lady called Chrisea, uh, Chrisea X, she calls herself. She's a young girl who grew up in rough, tough inner city London, um, who spent some terrible times of her life and you know, homeless and all that sort of stuff, but she's, turned to nature and now she's all about trying to get people in inner city areas to turn their heads and notice nature so it'll be very interesting i think it's her one of her sort of first talks outside of her circle so it'd be really good to hear what she has to say and on the 2nd of december we have uh, eric eaton he's written a book about wasps and we're going to be talking about the wasps of the world and there's more coming up um so please keep an eye on the listings or better still become a member of the Urban Bird of World membership community. Um, and not only do you get great discounts on products and services, but you also get to see all the in conversations with, including the up and coming in this particular one, the Q and A's. So all the Q and A's, because the Q and A's are not to be seen when 
we put them out on YouTube and on my, my, my normal website. So investigate that. So John, um, it's been fantastic having a chat with you all night today, tonight. And I know that Zoom isn't your favorite medium. <laughs> so I'm very honored that you actually broke from, you know, your normal feeling about Zoom to come on and talk tonight. Well, I, I did it because it was you asking, David, and I've really enjoyed myself. So thank you. Maybe I should be less reluctant to do Zoom in future because you've, you've, you've shown me it can be fun, not too scary after all. Oh, thanks. And um, we're just very help thankful. And I'm going to get you back next year to talk about orchids. That would be awesome. I'd love that. Good. Zoomers, thank you very much for sparing your evenings uh, to, uh, to watch tonight. It's been a fascinating talk. Um, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Got a Q&A coming up, but until then, keep looking up.